just one of this, this union makes me feel a, at home because uh, I grew up in Purdue, down in Lafayette, and they, they must have the same architect because the, the, uh, the wood paneling and the pool hall uh, remind me of uh, being a, a kid walking through that union on the way to school every day. Um, this is going to be, uh, if there's a movie rating, this is going to be a little bit of an R-rated talk. There'll be brief nudity, but it won't be the erotic kind. Uh, but uh, it's the result, uh, as uh, the introduction just said, of a study I've been doing for the past seven or eight years on the history of imperial marriage from Han to Qing, uh, the history of uh, the wives and concubines of Chinese emperors. But that topic generated many other uh, studies uh, on the way, um, and uh, one of them was uh, the, the, the phenomenon of the eunuch in the, in the imperial palace. And uh, a longer version of this talk will appear in uh, the first issue of a new journal called the Journal of Chinese Literature and Culture. I'm not sure when it comes out, but within the year. Uh, well, since ancient times in China, men voluntarily underwent castration in order to become eunuchs in service to the ruler. As a Han historian said, men would castrate themselves or their sons for the sake of self-advancement. If a man was lucky, uh, unquote. If a man was lucky, he could become the personal servant of the ruler himself. He could go from being the most worthless person in the realm, especially if he, if he failed to be selected to the palace, to gaining one of the greatest privileges on earth. He could be closer to the ruler than any official or palace woman, and perhaps even usurp imperial power. There's an 1891 novel uh, and it has a fortune teller who convinces, convinces a man that if he, ancient goddess Niwa and the Tang dynasty Wu Zetian could rule the land, then why couldn't a eunuch? An 1842 novel, a eunuch takes a potion to regrow his penis so that when he usurps the throne, he can enjoy sex with women just as all other emperors did. The implicit question, and this is the central question of my talk today, the implicit question of portrayals like these was something like this. How after his act of self-destruction did the eunuch reconstruct himself? How did he recreate, recreate himself as a newly potent man? So that's my title, The Potent Eunuch. Now I answer these questions by using both historical records and fictional fantasy from the Ming and Qing. And uh, I, do, I use these sources to read potency at its core level, that of sexual potency. For a key element in the story of the eunuch's transformation and a recurrent feature in Ming and Qing dynasty descriptions of eunuchs is his alleged sexuality. This is also cross-cultural. You'll see that in, in stories of eunuchs in uh, Byzantium and, uh, and uh, Mughal India and Ottoman, uh, Ottoman Empire. Rumors and fantasy allege that eunuchs were able to enjoy a sexual life as if they had not been castrated after all. Both historical and fictional accounts told about eunuchs who were never castrated to begin with or, or were able to use what was left of their castrated members to have sex or even to regrow their penises. Eunuchs were historically known to take interest in restorative drugs, though we can only guess about the goals and results. We also know that beginning in at least the Han Dynasty, eunuchs took wives and concubines and adopted sons in order to carry on their family line. And we should also presume it sought the respect and advantages that a normally potent man enjoyed. As for what kind of sexual life eunuchs may have experienced, virtually all the sources I've, construct, I've, I've consulted are sensational and or secondhand, though scientific and medical reports, which I have read, confirm that even the most spurious sources carry kernels of truth. And from those sources, uh, um, I've, I've, uh, they've told me that erection, ejaculation, emission of fluids, and libidinous thoughts, these can all occur separately. <clears throat> A man can experience the contractions of ejaculation with no penis, and he can have libidinous thoughts even if completely castrated. Though in general there's a crucial line, if he's been castrated as a boy, then he will be without libidinous thoughts. Um, my main example is the one in the title today, the most, one of the most notorious eunuchs in Chinese history, Wei Zhongxian, who nearly usurped power from the next to the last Ming emperor in the 1620s. The advantage of this choice is that numerous sources, both historical and fictional, allow us to reconstruct his life, and in particular, to examine how people imagined his life to be, especially in terms of his castration, 
how he went about castrating himself, the advantages he took of being a eunuch, and his alleged sexuality. Scientific and medical reports about castration further help our reconstruction, especially when it comes to the physiological effects of castration and the possibility of a sexual life for the eunuch, again, which was a common part of the eunuch narrative worldwide. Wei Zhengxian was the so-called dining partner of a, of a uh, palace wet nurse. Uh, no, um, one, let's see, the next one down here. Uh, Wei Zhengxian, Dui Shi is the word uh, for dining partner. Uh, and Wei Zhengxian was the so-called dining partner of a palace wet nurse known as Madame Ke, and who joined him in his near us usurpation of power. Dining partner, or Dui Shi, is an ancient term. Some of you probably know it. It, re it referred to two palace women, or else a palace woman and a eunuch, who formed a relationship like husband and wife. Um, and the term that was used in the Ming was uh, the next, uh, the next one, the one next to it, Tai Hu. Um, and uh, such relationships were common in the Ming palace. And in Wei's case, the focus of sensational stories about his supposed sexuality. Another key part of Wei Zhongxian's story was his associa association with other eunuchs, in particular one named uh, Liu Rouyu, the next one on the list there, who wrote uh, an autobiography, uh, Zhuo Zhongzhi. That's an autobiography of his life in the Ming Palace um, during Wei Zhongxian's time. And Liu Rouyu was imprisoned uh, after Wei Zhongxian's fall, and, uh, but wrote his this Zhuo Zhongzhi while in, uh, in prison uh, and, and tell about uh, the end of the, uh, he died shortly before the fall of the Ming. Uh, Liu, and Liu Rouyu was one of a handful of eunuchs in world history as far as I know, to leave an autobiographical account, so it's a, a particularly precious source. Besides telling about his own experience, he, he supplies important details about Wei Zhongxian, uh, Madame Ke, and their times in the palace. He's an example of a eunuch who engaged in a positive sort of reconstruction, if we are to believe his account anyway. That is, someone who promoted and was proud of the tradition of the loyal eunuch. And, the, and his service to the imperial rulers throughout Chinese history. Uh, well, first, it's, I'm going to now summarize a, a, some basic factual information about Wei Zhongxian and eunuchs in the Ming. Um, and, and much of this is from uh, sources in English that, uh, by, by uh, recent historians. Um, the, the emperor whom Wei Zhongxian served was uh, Zhu Yu Jiao, who ruled from 1620 to 1627 in the Tianxi reign period. He was a, a weak ruler, ill-educated, and poor at learning, and uh, he preferred hobbies and entertainment to governing. He was closely attached to his, um, his wet nurse, Madame Ke, who was like a mother to the young emperor who lost his own mother in 1605. And the emperor needed her near, nearby him all his life, even after marriage and fatherhood. Before becoming emperor, he was already fond of Wei Zhongxian, and after becoming emperor, brutally purged and killed officials who objected to Wei's and Ke's influence. That would be the, uh, the, uh, uh, the murder of many of the Dunglin partis uh, partisans in, in the 1620s. Um, just a few other facts, uh, as again, some of you may know already. Eunuchs were prominent in the Ming Dynasty, there, as many as eight, 80 to 100,000 by the end of the dynasty. And they were a firmly established part of the Ming bureaucracy by about the mid-15th century. And their most notorious role was uh, being spies, carrying out intelligent, intelligence work for the emperor, being his eyes and ears, in, to, in order to ensure that officials in the civil and military bureaucracy were behaving properly. Um, well, how did a man become a eunuch? That's one of the things that uh, the sources I'm, I've been looking at uh, like, to, like to report about and especially fantasize about. Uh, in, in, in terms of in reality, uh, there's not much that one can find out, but in terms of origins, many palace eunuchs in the Ming came from prefectures south of Beijing. And uh, again, they would either be castrated as boys, or they voluntarily underwent castration after puberty, sometimes even after marriage, as in the case of Wei Zhongxian. As had long been the case, becoming a palace eunuch was seen as a means of advancing oneself, and also advancing one's family. But in the Ming, according to sources, the supply eventually far exceeded the demand. At times, thousands appeared to be selected, already having had themselves castrated, 
only to meet with orders from the palace to punish them and drive them away. And many supposedly became beggars and even bandits who roamed around preying on victims. And fictional and historical sources uh, also describe, describe that. As for Liu Ruoyu, the, the, the eunuch who wrote the autobiography that I've consulted, he tells us that he was from a military family that gave him an education for an eventual career as in officialdom. But in the summer of 1598, he says, he forsook his studies because of a strange dream, which he does not tell us about, but after that he had himself castrated. He doesn't tell us exactly how that happened either. In the 1620s, he served one of Wei Zhongxian's lieutenants, uh, Li Yongzhen, uh, down there at the bottom, and from that vantage point, observed the people and events during the regime of Wei, Zhongxian, of Wei Zhongxian and Madame Ke. Because Wei Zhongxian was illiterate and uh, Liu Ruoyu was highly literate, uh, Wei Zhongxian relied on people like uh, Li Yongzhen, who was also literate, and Liu Ruoyu for written communication and interpretation of memorials and other palace documents. And then came the enthronement, the, the death of the Tianqi Emperor and the enthronement of the Chongzhen Emperor who reigned from 1627 to the end of the dynasty in 1644. At that point, Wei Zhongxian and Li Yongzhen fell from power. Well, Wei Zhongxian committed suicide, Li Yongzhen was executed, and Liu Ruoyu was implicated because he worked for them and was put in prison where he wrote his uh, eunuch's diary. Um, now, let's look at Wei Zhongxian and beginning with what the records say in the Ming, the history of the Ming, and, and, uh, and also Liu Ruoyu's uh, um, autobiography. And I'll save for later the more sensational and less easy to verify accounts. Uh, Wei, Wei Zhongxian came from a lower social rank than Liu Ruoyu, but like Liu, he had himself castrated after puberty. Wei differed, however, in that he had already married and had a daughter. According to Liu Ruoyu, Wei Zhongxian lost his parents when he was young and was left in poverty. And in Liu Ruoyu's words, Wei Zhongxian loved women, liked to gamble, enjoyed drinking and partying, and was fond of flashy clothing and galloping around on horseback." Unquote. These details were common among the sources, both historical and fictional. And these appeared in, right after Wei Zhongxian's death. And that in itself is an interesting phenomenon. Uh, um, 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 many uh, biography appeared right away, and four novels that I'm going uh, two of whom, two of which I'm going to be looking at in a little while, and then later on drama and, and uh, many other many other things right away. Because of harassment, uh, getting back to Wei Zhongxian's life, because of harassment by gambling partner, partners, he had himself castrated in order to escape debt and enter palace service. Well, we can speculate. Perhaps he came from a region south of the capital that was a major supplier of eunuchs. So perhaps having oneself castrated was part of common knowledge. It was a route. It was a career uh, um, uh, path. Uh, he was recruited into the palace in 1589 during the Wanli period, and he served many years in lowly positions until he finally made his way to his first influential post as a cook for the Tianqi Emperor's mother. And that's how he got to know the young prince, the, the future emperor. And because of Wei Zhongxian's aptitude for play and entertainment, he won the uh, young prince's favor. Um, there are other stories I'll pass over that uh, uh, Madame Ke had, had another eunuch that was his, her dining partner. Uh, and uh, then she switched to Wei Zhongxian. And there was a, a, a fight between the earlier eunuch and Wei Zhongxian at one point, that was supposedly overheard by the emperor himself, who came and asked what was going on, and uh, came on the side, came down on the side of Wei Zhongxian at Madame Ke's uh, behest. Uh, more on the phenomenon of dining partners a little bit later, though. Let's go now to Madame Ke, the, the, the wet nurse herself, because. Wei's relationship with her gets us to the core of what I'm talking about today, the phenomenon of eunuch sexual transformation and the fascination that people had with the possibility of a sexual life after castration. Just a few brief um, bits of information about Madame Ke. Um, she, got to the, she entered the palace about age 18 when she already had a son. Uh, wet nurse, of course, would only be chosen after she had proven herself uh, to have had a child and be able to nurse a child. Her son died soon after her recruitment. After assuming the throne, uh, Zhu Yaojiao, 
the emperor granted her the title of Lady Who Serves the Sage, Feng Sheng Furen, and gave her a precious golden seal of office. A seal like that, of course, was normally only given to a, an empress and was used to authorize decisions. To give such a seal to a wet nurse was utterly unconventional. And Madame Ke helped get Wei Zhongxian promoted. And uh, she was about 40 uh, at this time and was at first allowed to live in quarters near the emperor. But then it came time for the emperor's marriage and it was unseemly for her to live there. So she had to move out, but still within the imperial city. But then in fall 1621, officials objected to her intimacy with the emperor and demanded that she, be, she move out of the imperial city. So she moved to a private residence in Beijing, but returned every day at noon and stayed with the emperor until dark. Then a month later moved back because the emperor missed her too much. And she still kept her private residence, which was near Wei Zhongxian's private residence outside the imperial city. And whenever Madame Ke returned, she received a special order from the emperor who provided her with a large uh, escort. So now, uh, let's uh, move to the uh, fictional sources. And um, um, Wei Zhongxian's life in, in Ming fiction. Um, as with the earlier Ming eunuch uh, Liu Jian, who served in Emperor uh, Wu Zong's reign, Wu Zong is the Zhengde emperor, uh, Liu Jian, as many of you know, was one of... Uh, Liu Jian and Wei Zhongxian were two of the four uh, so-called eunuch dictators of the, the Ming dynasty. Now, as with Liu Jian, Wei Zhongxian became, uh, as I just said, subject of history, fiction, and drama. And as I just said also, in his case, immediately after his downfall. Three novels appeared alone, three novels alone appeared in 1628. Another came in 1644, and in the meantime, other, uh, other works had also appeared. Why so soon and why so many hundreds of pages about him? Um, some of these novels, um, oops, the other way. Uh, there we go, yeah. Uh, a novel, the novel uh, Tao Wu Xianping, which is 1644, the first one up there, um, is 566 pages in one of its modern editions. Um, but at that time, of course, there was already a lively market in, in pu publishing in the late Ming, with large numbers of titles appearing, editions, editions issued and reissued, and authors full of drive, and in this case, outrage at the scale of corruption and the ensuing catastrophe. Wei Zhongxian was an illiterate rake and a palace slave who almost became emperor. He was a sensational character in people's imaginations. In writing about him, authors relied on common knowledge, some of the facts I've just related, written sources and hearsay, but also gave rein to pure fantasy. Tao Wu Xianping, for example, has him fighting off the man who in 1615 infiltrated the, cap the palace and tried to kill the heir apparent, uh, Zhu Chang Luo, with a club. That, that incident uh, occurred, the man with a club uh, in infiltrating the palace, but Wei Zhongxian could not have been involved in that. In all four novels, some, of, some sort of supernatural force assists Wei Zhongxian. They have that in common. Whether it's a fortune teller predicting his rise to high position, or apparitions preventing him from committing suicide, at his worst, uh, uh, and, or guiding him on his way to Beijing, or a Taoist priest inexplicably helping him, inexplicably helping him at his worst moment. Now, in fact, Liu Rouyu, in his autobiography, wrote that when once someone had imprisoned Wei Zhongxian, and intended to starve him to death, a Buddhist priest, a Buddhist monk interceded and got him freed. So there seems to be some kernel of truth um, in, that, in those reports and the, and, that, uh, and, and the fantasies that resulted from that. But here then is a key way of looking at Wei Zhongxian. In taking his story to the level of the supernatural, authors were treating him as if he were part of the karmic, des the karmic destiny of China. Not just a lowly eunuch who through clever opportunism managed to usurp imperial power. In other words, there were forces beyond Wei Zhongxian, the individual, that put him on the road he took. He was an instrument of dynastic decline, as if the gods deliberately positioned him. Now, uh, Tao Wu Xianping is not the first novel, of course. Uh, the first novel to appear about Wei's life was uh, Jing Shi Yin Yang Meng, uh, up there on my uh, slide, which appeared in 1628. And uh, both it and uh, Tao Xianping 
portray the pre- and post-castrated way in desperate straits before entering the palace, even joining a band of eunuch beggars. Uh, these novels share many plot elements, uh, one copying from the last. Now, as I said before, these bands of eunuch beggars really actually existed, although I've found no evidence of Wei having actually joined one. As his, at his lowest point in both novels, he develops, in other novels about him as well, he develops stinking ulcers all over his body. In Jing Shi Yin, there's a slight ver, uh, 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 contrast. In Jing Shi Yin, Yin Yang Meng, he cures himself by eating snake meat. In Tao Wu Xianming, he cures himself by eating dog meat, in each case carefully cooked and savored. And now, though, he's ready to go to Beijing and begin his life as imperial eunuch. He's like a mock hero passing through phases of mythic ordeals before achieving apotheosis. Now what these novels do that dynastic and other histories usually do not do is to detail how things supposedly happened and what people said and thought to themselves, as in the, experts that I will, the excerpts that I, I will give below about how and why he castrated himself. It's one thing when Someone like Li Yongzhen is castrated at age four. We know that because that's what the, the biography of Li Yongzhen says in the Ming history. Biographies of eunuchs usually contain a sentence, have a sentence or two telling you when they entered the palace, and many of them also tell you when he castrated himself or was castrated by his parents. But yeah, so such was the experience of many eunuchs. They were castrated as boys. But when a mature man decides to undergo castration, his motivation becomes a topic of fascination on the part of writers and other observers as who engaged in remarkable feats of fantasy. Relying on factual sources when possible, I will now piece together a composite fantasy based on works that tell how and why a man had himself castrated and what happened afterwards. A recurrent part of that fantasy, as I have said, is the man's ability to continue to have sex and in some cases even regrow, regrow his sexual organ. 19th century descriptions, um, there's one in particular by G. Carter Stent that many people refer to from about 1877, something like that. Uh, 19th century descriptions report uh, that in Beijing there were people who specialized in the operation to castrate a man. And uh, such things were referred to even earlier, uh, in earlier centuries. And in the Qing, they, re they received imperial approval to perform the operation, which, as some of you might know, involved removal of the entire organ. Um, not everyone went to specialists, though, and uh, um, we don't know uh, uh, who did and who did not. Um, in the case of boys whose male elders performed the procedures, did they go to local specialists, or did, was there just common knowledge that was passed around? Uh, I, I don't know. Did some men, did some grown men castrate themselves, as portrayed in fiction in the cases of Wei Zhongxian or Liu Jian? Uh, uh, again, there seems to be evidence of that, but uh, no, no reliable, uh, uh, credible sources that I have found. Uh, Norman Kutcher has uh, written an article on eunuchs in the, in the Qing, and he writes that in order to increase the number of eunuchs in his service, the Qianlong Emperor loosened previous restrictions and he now allowed men who self-castrated. Okay, so that obviously was something that was, was a, a factor, a variable. And uh, he allowed men who self-castrated, whether doing so by themselves or having the oper operation performed by others without authorization, authorization by the Imperial Household Bureau. Credible stories about men who castrated themselves, are, as I said, are hard to come by. Uh, but G. Carter Stent, who I just mentioned, he told of a beggar who in 1853 castrated himself and pawned his severed organ. Why would he pawn his severed organ? This is another detail that um, it, it was valuable because eunuchs who entered the imperial palace preserved their severed organs, but sometimes lost them or never secured them to begin with or they were stolen and they needed them for periodic inspection and promotion and bur burial. Men wanted to be buried with that. And uh, in this regard, uh, I heard from a friend in Beijing last summer, uh, again, this is just word of mouth, that uh, fake wooden penises were found in, in, in eunuch graves in uh, uh, Beijing, but then they were thrown away um, sometime after 
1949 because they were just too sensitive as, uh, as artifacts. So this is word of mouth, and if you know any more than anybody, let me know, because that's an interesting fact. <laughs> now, fictional recreations of eunuch self-castration are particularly graphic, as found in the late, uh, a late Ming novel I referred to before. I haven't told you the name of it. It's uh, Bai Mudan, White Peony. That's, one, that's about um, Liu Jian, the, the no notorious Ming eunuch. First, he secludes himself in a room, and he leaves a note with instructions about what to do in the aftermath. He cuts off his organ himself, applies medicine to the wound, and then faints to the floor. Others rush in, and they see the note, and then this is something we'll look at in a second here. That, uh, in, for those that want to read Chinese, I'll read the English, or my paraphrasing of it. Uh, others r rush in and they, f they see the note and they follow its instructions, which are the oddest thing I've ever read in my life. I had to read it many times in order to try to come up with a translation, which may be wrong because I, I, it's so hard to imagine that I, I just may have missed what's obvious. But the instructions were to take the severed organ, heat it up on a piece of clay tile, heat it up on a piece of hot clay tile until it turns to a black crisp, then rub it into a fine powder, form a pill, mix it with strong liquor, and pour the liquor down the man's throat, and that supposedly stops the pain and cures him. Okay? Then they apply the leavings of the drug to the wound to stop the bleeding, and then after which he regains consciousness, the bleeding stops, and he recovers immediately. So this is pure fantasy. Now mixing drugs into powder, mixing ashes into a pill and swallowing it, that's something that you can see in, in drug making uh, in many other places. So that part's not unusual, but heating it up on the hot piece of hot clay tile, I, I don't uh, I don't know. Although there's something in the, the Ban Sao Gang Mu that's somewhat similar. Okay, there's something in there. But anyway, historical studies of Wei Zhongxian can uncover no evidence about how he conducted his, an, his castra castration, but three somewhat overlapping fictional versions portray him doing it by himself, or in one case, suffering as an accident. Um, in Jing Shi Yin Yang Meng, as a, uh, he suffers from these skin ulcers which are over his entire body and assail him to the point that he tries to kill himself, but an apparition prevents him, uh, after which he sees how well eunuch beggars are doing, and he decides to go join some. He hides in, a, he hides in an abandoned shrine and applies the knife, because he hasn't castrated himself yet. He, he hides in an abandoned shrine, because he's going to join eunuch beggars now. He applies the knife, and then afterwards he, applies, he takes ashes from old incense remains, and uses that to stanch the, the blood. Uh, and, and the novel says, although it hurts, in the end, he was a treacherous and evil person and crude and fearless, so it didn't bother him." Unquote. Uh, three more critical points in the description in this passage are that it was important for the recently castrated man to avoid windy drafts. That's something you can find as early as the Han Dynasty. Okay, avoiding windy drafts. You put the castrated man in a, in a room where there's no drafts. You must lose as little blood as possible. And you use old ash, not recent ash. Thus the convenience of the abandoned shrine with its old incense ash. Now Tao Wu Xianping uh, is the most unusual and even comical uh, fantasy. He likewise suffers from ulcers all over his body. And he's homeless and penniless and he joins a band of beggars. Um, he's still uh, an uncastrated man. Uh, a Taoist priest gives him money, but the beggars find out. They get him drunk, they strip him naked, they take his things, and then they throw him in a river. And the current of the river carries him to the opposite bank. There happen to be two dogs there. They sniff him and bite off his penis and testicles. And their curiosity is aroused because as the a uh, prurient narrator explains he's drunk and he'd been plunged into cold water which made his penis grow stiff. When he discovers that he's missing his organ, he says, am I dreaming uh, to himself? He figures that the beggars cut it off. And he takes old incense ash to apply to the wound to stop the bleeding and relieve the pain. And the narr narrator explains as if uh, referring to factual information to help make his account credible. As it turns out, old incense ash can halt bleeding and stop pain." Unquote. And then later, Wei Zhengxian joins a band of eunuch beggars and robbers and finally meets a fortune teller who gives him money and points his way to Beijing and the palace. The, uh, another novel, did I give it? 
oh, that one, the last one there, um, has a, an amusing scene in which uh, he's in desperate straits because of debt, and he decides to castrate himself and makes love with his wife, makes mad love all night long with his wife the night before, and she doesn't know what he's going to do, so she's wondering why. Can't you just wait and slow down? And, and uh, <laughs> then the next morning he does it and uh, uh, sells his wife to pay off his debt. Um, so, um, all right. Now, um, let me move to the topic of the sexual potency of eunuchs. As, as I said before, it's a key element in the portrayal of their diabolical character. Uh, but first, <clears throat> let me consider some uh, medical, medical knowledge and studies of late-era eunuchs. Um, okay? um, and I'd, <clears throat> I'd be glad for anyone who has other um, sources they know. I just collected what I could, um, uh, scientific and medical reports, <clears throat> on uh, the effects of castration, and then uh, um, when there were still eunuchs around in the early 20th century, there, they were observed by doctors and scientists, so I just gathered what I could from those sources. And uh, for what I learned, a man underwent a varied range of side effects, and uh, I just, a few of them, um, atrophy or cessation of growth of the prostate, uh, breast enlargement, um, thinning of the bones, curvature of the spine as they aged. Of course, these, none of these are universal, right? Enlargement of the pituitary. These are among others, okay? If you read descriptions of eunuchs, uh, of course, eunuchs were the guardians of Mecca and Medina, the holy sites. And descriptions of those eunuchs, they, they uh, as when they're old, as a very wrinkled, exceedingly wrinkled, more so than, a, than a, uh, an uncastrated man. You get descriptions like these. Uh, boy eunuchs probably became adults with virtually no sexual appetite. <clears throat> and according to G. Carter's stint, this led to their being prized by palace women as personal servants. I don't have much other evidence on that either. So that would be interesting. Uh, I'm, some, some information is, is, is sensational, uh, is rumor, uh, might be true only because it was, but was only passed by word of mouth and we'll never know. But men castrated after puberty, this is a key divide, of course, Men castrated after puberty could, to varying degrees, still experience sexual desire and, and in external appearance, pass as ordinary men. Um, the usual uh, stereotype is that uh, um, men lose all their facial hair, but that's not the case. Um, um, and important variables in the after effects of castration include the way in which a man was castrated, for example, violent injury or surgical removal, how well the surgery was done, how extensive the injury or the removal was. Even a small fleshy root of uh, the penis could become erect, according to my information. And whether the castration occurred in an inv individual who was healthy or diseased, strong or weak. And psychological and emotional factors also made a difference. But in general, there had to, be, there had to have been a, a, a variety of results in terms of bodily change and sexual function and desire. And as I said above, erection, ejaculation, emission of fluids, libidinous, libidinous thoughts, these can all occur separately. Uh, now, bizarre and sensational stories about their, the eunuch sexual activity were common in the Ming and elsewhere in the world, many spurred by the hatred of characters such as Wei Zhongxian. Less sensational accounts tell of emperors who prized young, handsome eunuchs. Although contemporary scientific evidence only allows us to guess about the historical records, we can, we can do so without imposing a rigid model of what sexual intercourse was supposed to be upon such distant figures. Now let me look at a few figures uh, that I, uh, a few writers that I've, um, okay, starting with uh, Sung Chi Feng, uh, early Qing writer. He asserted that Wei Zhengxian never had been castrated. Now it is safe to approach that story with disbelief although we still can uh, retain an interest in the possibilities that it, raise, it, that it raises. Sung states that Wei had no testicles, but still had a penis and could get erect. And that has been shown to be possible in other parts of the world. Uh, but nevertheless, the procedures for selecting eunuchs for the palace, as far as I know, would presumably have ensured that no such thing could have happened. Um, but still, hypothetically, if Wei Zhengxian had slipped through the screening process with a remnant penis, the evidence is clear that such a man could still be sexually active. Um, now, the rigorousness of palace inspection uh, can be guessed at 
from a report by uh, a late Qing French doctor, um, Jean-Jacques Matignon. And um, he uh, referred to a 22-year-old 22, 22 eunuch who once came to Matignon's hospital in Beijing desiring the removal of what palace inspectors had told him was too much of a stump of remnant flesh. The eunuch later disappeared, so the pro uh, operation was never performed and, and Matignon never saw him again. As for Sung Chi Feng's assertion that Wei still had a penis, this makes sense mainly as part of the code of portrayal of the diabolical eunuch and has its locus classicus in the case of uh, Lao Ai up there, the third century BC man who according to Sima Qian disguised himself as a eunuch but was never castrated and had, a, and had, had an affair with the queen <coughs> and was supposedly the true father of the first emperor of the Qin. This is probably an untrue story, but uh, it's one of the early sensational stories about pseudo-eunuchs. Another early Qing writer, Tang Zhen, he wondered how Madame Ke could have preferred Wei Zhongxian's strength to the other eunuch she was with before Wei Zhongxian. Because uh, <coughs> Tang Zhen said both men lacked the yang. But Tang once heard a rumor which perhaps explained why. And uh, here it is. Although eunuchs have been castrated, they still retain both potential and actual energy. Although their yang lacks the wholeness of normal men, it still protrudes to a certain degree. I have also heard that they practice exotic techniques, allowing, themselves to, allowing them to regrow their yang. I always laughed at such stories and refused to believe them. Then he reports uh, about a eunuch that he heard who is now dead. That eunuch had two concubines. One of them visited Tang's household, and the, uh, and the female servants at Tang's household asked the, uh, the deceased eunuch's concubine what it was like in bed with a eunuch. And she told them her eunuch was quite lusty, and during intercourse his penis extended about an inch or so. The moral of the story, Tang Zhen concluded, was that eunuchs were still inherently men and therefore dangerous if allowed to mingle with the women of the harem. Moreover, because they were sex-starved and resentful, palace women were prone to have affairs with them. If we recall, one of the interests <coughs> of Liu Rou Yu and other eunuchs was the science of nourishing life, Yang Sheng. Liu Rou Yu might have known about drugs, for example, that contained male hormones made from urine, which existed from the Sung Dynasty on and were used in China, and that took tissues from, tissue from parts of animals, including the testicles, to treat sexual debility and impotence, and which was common in China and elsewhere in the world. Um, so I'm going to, yeah, let me think a minute. I'm going to <coughs> go into a, <coughs> a range of uh, concluding thoughts here. Um, now, the Im image of the lusty eunuch. The image of the lusty eunuch was never going to be charming or appealing. He was a marginal, figure, a marginal figure who was never going to be vindicated or revered. It was impossible for him to join the ranks of heroes and gods, as well as characters told about in centuries of stories about the strange and the supernatural, such as feathered immortals or Taoist adepts. I think of him as like the animal or insect demons in COG, Journey to the West, who stole vital essence from humans in order to achieve long life and immortality. Like them, the eunuch was stuck at the low end of the hierarchy of sentient beings. He was supposed to be so low that he had no choice but to enslave himself to the emperor and be thankful for being able to do so. The best he could do would be, was to be a loyal eunuch which meant contributing to the fine functioning of the palace, but keeping a low profile, perhaps influencing the emperor subtly from behind the scenes, but always in the end deferring to those with true sexual capacity. <clears throat> now after Wei Zhongxian, the book about evil eunuchs was nearly closed for good in Chinese history. Qing eunuchs had nothing like the privilege and power they had in the Ming. They were fewer in number, if we, I remember I said 80,000 to 100,000 during the Ming, uh, they peaked at over 3,000 during the Kangxi era in the Qing, and they declined during the 19th century due to the lesser number of consorts and imperial children. Qing rulers prohibited Manchus from becoming eunuchs, uh, in that way resembling the Ottoman Empire that likewise prohibited eunuchs, eunuchs coming from its ruling people. 
although the rule was not followed consistent, consistently since many members of the, unit, of the Qing Court Theatrical Bureau, for example, came from banner registers. As mentioned above, the Qianlong Emperor loosened restrictions on the recruitment of eunuchs, which, ha among other things, led to their greater freedom of movement, as, as is evident in reports of the frequent runaways and eunuchs who moved from one station to another in the palace and outside. Uh, then came Empress Dowager Cixi, and the story of evil eunuchs uh, appeared one last time. Her opposition to the 1898 reforms gave rise to resentment and led detractors to resort to old methods of vilifying women rulers. Rumors ascribed a hidden penis to her first eunuch favorite, Anda Hai. Um, let's look at that. I'm skipping Shanda Fu up there, so just look at the second one arm down. Um, uh, they, the rumors allege that Sushi and Anda Hai had a son. And they also tell about her involvement with a second favorite, Li, Lian, Li Lianying. Um, and uh, uh, of course, as I just learned last night from David here, uh, in, in uh, late Qing opera, eunuchs were portrayed uh, positively. And I hadn't known that before. But um, in these reports, especially after the 1898 reforms, uh, they were, uh, the, they were um, sensational and vilifying. Another story said that Dowager, the dowager had a man delivered to her in her bedroom in a food trunk. A 1901 book by a political activist from Singapore, uh, Lin Bun Kang, uh, Lin, Wen, Lin, Wen, Lin Wen Qing, uh, spread rumors about her affairs with men disguised as eunuchs and smuggled into the palace, and then added that the dowager would have them murdered after having sex with them. Uh, that probably comes from uh, uh, this Jananfeng in the, uh, the Jin dynasty, uh, the stories about her having men smuggled into the palace and then, then murdering them after having sex with them. Uh, you know, so I, there's a repertoire of stories that you can use to vilify women rulers, and so they were coming out again in, in, with Cixi. Then 1916, uh, Tsai Dongfan wrote a novel, the, the Cixi Taiho Yan Yi in a scene of which Cixi murmurs intimately with Li Lianying and her foot rests on his knee for him to rub. Then they compose themselves when someone enters the room. The belief in the dowager's in intimacy with, with eunuchs was stubborn. Um, according to her palace maid, uh, Harungar, however, uh, there were always court ladies and servants with the dowager. How, the, how Harungar asked, could such things occur without their knowing? She condemned as nonsense the reports about Anda Hai having a penis or Li Lianying massaging the empress. Only Liu, the hairdresser, a eunuch whom Harungar was forced by the dowager to marry, by the way, only Liu, the hairdresser, was allowed to enter and tend to the dowager's hair. No man other ever touched her otherwise. Um, let me end by citing a series of foreign writers um, that are listed up here and their characterizations of eunuchs, starting with the Frenchman uh, Georges Soulier de Morin, who was a scholar and a novelist and a diplomat who, among other things, introduced acupuncture to France. He wrote a semi-fictional biography of the Empress in um, 1911 that similarly mixed fantasy with facts, um, uh, the title listed up there. In de Morin's story, the dowager made love to young men brought to her by the eunuch Li Lianying. And uh, as ordered by the dowager, Li Lianying would stab the men to death from behind just as they reached sexual climax. <clears throat> In uh, de Morin's words, Cixi, the dowager, experienced a strange love for eunuchs, especially Anda Hai and Li Lianying. And the relations she had with them in de Moron's words had a peculiar and incomplete sort of charm as if taking place in a dream, unquote. There was a certain delicateness about eunuchs that she loved, yet also a remnant, of, a remnant touch of masculinity. And de Moron described the day in November of the year in which the young Cixi first entered the palace when Anda Hai was delegated to examine her. His job, which in reality could never have been so, was to make sure that she had no defects and to verify that she was still a virgin. Uh, again, that could never have happened. Palace women were assigned to do the final stage of, of uh, recruitment, as far as I have found in, in my sources. Eunuchs do the first stage, 
of recruiting the women who will become empresses and, 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 and concubines. And at the very final stages, the bodily exam the examination is, is conducted by um, palace women. Um, and back to Georges uh, Soulier de Morin, um, uh, talking about Andahai and his uh, 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 encounter with Sushi when she was first delivered to the palace. Uh, de Morin goes on saying, he had loved her since the first day he had seen her. Uh, and in his words, his hands trembled as he helped her undress, his, his eyes laden with unfulfillable desire. Uh, unquote. The strange being of the eunuch in de Maron's fantasies can be juxtaposed with descriptions by witnesses who saw and heard eunuchs, but likewise presented them in an alien light. Uh, George Carter Stent, who I referred to already a few times, he referred to young eunuchs as being very handsome and feminine. But he found the older ones repulsive looking. As he wrote, there was something painfully comical in their appearance. To him they were all hairless, and they spoke in a cracked falsetto as a Billingsgate fish bag might. Uh, medical and scientific reports, as I've noted before uh, above, indicate that the voices of men castrated after puberty do not change. So the men, when they joke of, uh, of, of hurting themselves and they suddenly go into a high pitch, they're, they're being inaccurate, all right? Um, but uh, it's a common joke, uh, so. Um, but medical and scientific reports uh, would, would, would indicate that the voices of castrated boys remain high. And again, also, as I said, men castrated as adults may still grow beards. Matignon, the French doctor, wrote of an old eunuch who visited his hospital, who had a particularly strident falsetto which could be heard from a distance. And in his words, he was noisy and exuberant, talked about everything to everyone, and like a grown-up child, showed surprise at everything he saw." Unquote. On the other hand, we have the American Catherine Carl, who was a painter and lived in the Qing Palace for nine months in 1903 to 1904 while painting Dowager Tsushi's portrait. And she wrote of high-ranking eunuchs who had clear, melodious voices and spoke beautiful Mandarin. In the maid Harungar's description, the eunuchs who attended the Dowager walked slowly and serenely, spoke softly, and maintained an attitude of dignity and respect. Um, what's, no, just my final picture. This is uh, a, a, a waist tag, an identification tag worn by uh, eunuchs in the Ming that is in the, the Haidian Museum in Beijing. And uh, so I'll just leave that um, while I finish off here. Um, eunuchs were the em emperor's personal slaves. They belonged to the category of what Confucius called petty people, xiaoren, whom Confucius defined side by side with women in a famous saying in the Analects, women and servants are especially difficult to deal with. If you get close to them, they take advantage of you. If you distance yourself from them, they become resentful. The Kangxi emperor quoted the same words in his maxims to his sons. And he added, I have often observed how members of the base class in the palace behave when you extend them a bit of kindness because of some slight indiligence on their part. The inevitable result is a display of unbridled recklessness which leads to mishaps that completely cancel the effect of their previous good behavior. Yet if you treat them distantly, they're full of resentment behind your back." Unquote. Base people included eunuchs whom he claimed to keep, in his words, only for common personal tasks and casual everyday conversation and amusement." Unquote. Kangxi, the Kangxi Emperor never discussed political affairs with them, nor did he allow them out of the palace, and he kept their pay low. He did, however, employ them to convey confidential information to major political figures and had several trusted eunuchs to one of whom he wrote 17 letters during his campaign with, against Galdan in 1697. Those letters translated in Jonathan Spence's book. And moreover, when, Kangxi Emperor, when the Kangxi Emperor was a boy, two of his earliest teachers of calligraphy were, were learned eunuchs from the Ming Palace. In warning about petty people and eunuchs, the Kangxi Emperor was in general referring to the fact that an emperor and his sons, especially the son who was to be successor, lived in an environment surrounded by women, children, and slaves. The Kangxi Emperor thus summarized an essential question. 
which was, how was a boy or man to avoid the debilitating effects of life among those without a full-fledged penis? The potent eunuch, an imaginary figure who occasionally entered reality, of course answered by implying that the full-fledged penis was as potentially hollow as the castrated one. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> I welcome questions, comments. David. Many of these units are associated with entertainment. So entertainers in another class of children. And then in uh, fiction, often women can get the attention by performance. Gets which? Get, get. Uh, and in the novels, often get uh, people's attention by its ability to perform, the central mm -hmm. uh, type of uh, song performance. Right. I should have said at the very end, by the way, that in the Qing, uh, of course, they had uh, imperial bond servants, and uh, they had they had uh, a system which checked the power of eunuchs. So the the problem, the dilemma of the the young emperor growing up in, in surrounded by women or eunuchs, is wasn't quite as uh, the same in the Qing as it was in earlier dynasties. But well, on the other hand, there are all these eunuchs that perform plays. Right. So so right. Thank you. I have a question. <clears throat> About the eunuch, what, when did the custom start? When did the like, uh -huh. Yeah. In the British? No, right. Uh, w when did it start? The eunuch was in, uh, in uh, Muslim Sahara. Right. That time is very long. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And I guess, you know, from what I know, in the Chinese uh, royal family, starting from Mian Dynasty, they started to have stories about the uh, mm -hmm. But, well, you, you, you call it something, something uh, evoked BC, you know, the year BC in, in, in your slide. So, there must be, it's always, always puzzles me if it's uh, imported from the uh, Turkish or from the oh. Western, the, yeah. the Arabian uh, culture. Or uh, yeah. how did the Chinese, uh, how come the studies of the Mian dynasty, even you know, more stories about the Union coming mm. out, or Qin dynasty especially, uh -huh. yeah. more Union uh, stories? Yeah. Well, that's a. Well, that's okay. The question, if, if in case people didn't hear, uh, it, one of the questions is when did this, the custom of having eunuchs begin, and, and how did it enter China, or how did it begin in China, and then um, also the stories that are in the Ming, why are there so many such stories in the Ming, and were there such stories before? Um, the beginning, well, in my, uh, and I'm, you know, I haven't done full study of this, but uh, in, in the earliest times, cast, uh, enemy, captured enemies were uh, ca castrated and, and then enslaved. So that's the beginning of, of, of uh, eunuch enslavement in China, 
and other parts of the world. The castrating an enemy was pretty common uh, in many places. I don't think you can say, I don't think we're going to be able to say where it came to, if it came to China from someplace else. I, I doubt we'll be able to say something like that. Uh, it, you know, it's, it, that's, it's just too remote. But they don't, and they, they, they don't all, always only serve in the harem. And that's also the case um, in uh, other parts of the world. Um, that's, that's one of the major places that we think of them working. But they, eunuchs, of course, also were military commissioners in the Tang. They led armies. Uh, they, they, were, uh, they did many other things besides simply act as servants in the, in the women's quarters. Um, let me think. Uh, and of course, Byzantium had eunuchs. Okay, eunuchs, but no harem. That's an exception because uh, you know, my my first approach to the to the phenomenon of eunuchs was to think that it necessarily went with polygamy and harems, but uh, not completely because in Byzantium they had eunuchs, many of whom were religious figures, bishops, and but they also were useful to um, women rulers in Byzantium, useful intermediaries. Uh, so there is that connection. Uh, women rulers often leagued with, with eunuchs, um, and uh, uh, they were good uh, intermediaries between the, the women and the, uh, the male officials. Uh, let's see, now of course there's, there, there, about the Ming and the reason we have so many stories uh, in, uh, is pro pro partly because there's just so many sources left from that time. Uh, the Sung dynasty was was pretty much free of this kind of thing, but of course the Han and the Tang both had, uh, and the Han especially, had, had uh, uh, major uh, troubles, if you want to call it that, with, with eunuch power. Uh, and, and the story of sexual hakey panky, uh, uh, the first, the earliest would be Lao Ai in, 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 as the supposed father of Qin Shi Huang, who was, who was uh, a fake eunuch. So some of these stories go, go way back and in other parts of the world too. But uh, the, the, the raciest, most sensational ones, they, they, they begin to really gather in the Ming. And uh, especially, I would say, especially after Wei Zhongxian, and then at the end of the Qing. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Yeah, well, um, how much they they uh, communicated about things, uh, yeah, I, I don't I don't know. Uh, the, the earliest sources on eunuchs that I've studied were, would be in the Zhuozhuan, and then even somewhat uh, a reference in the Shijing, uh, and and the see. As for the Persian Empire, one another interesting thing, and this is something that I, I only can touch on from my own reading in, in uh, um, you know history of of Greece and Rome. Uh, at, at first, Unix is an is a oriental phenomenon. Uh, the, the, it goes up to the edge of, the, of Central Asia, the Middle East. But then the Romans adopted Unix. And uh, uh, I don't know enough about it to go, go deeply into it. But uh, Alexander the Great, uh, ha, he adopted certain features of Persian rulers as part of uh, his attempt to, uh, well, grow his, his aura and uh, um, clothing and uh, other kinds of presentation and including also having eunuchs was, was part of the image. So that's an interesting thing I'd like to look at more. But what the cross is between China and, and Persia and other parts of uh, inner and central Asia is, is, uh, would be fascinating. Of course the Mongols and other uh, nomadic peoples didn't have eunuchs when they became, when they adopted Chinese style um, um, palace institutions then they began to have eunuchs. And uh, they w I, think, um, I think the Catan, if I'm, uh, somebody in the north, uh, around Catan time, I may be wrong, but they, they, they stole a few eunuchs from some of the, uh, five, the northern five dynasties. And, uh, because that, again, that seemed to be what you did. If you were gonna be a Chinese style dynasty and have, uh, you no longer could have uh, multiple wives of roughly equal status, you had to have one main wife and everyone else was a concubine, you also had to have eunuchs, and uh, so 
that was another thing that became what the non the non Han dynasties did. Anyway, I'm babbling. So, yes, um, Joseph, right in front, and then then. Uh, oh, okay. No eunuchs. No, Japan is another interesting. No opium and no eunuchs. Okay. <laughs> the, Japan. Uh, Yeah. And uh, especially from Ming and Qing dynasty. Right. I, I was wondering, maybe the Mongol, Mongols, when they conquered, you know, Chinese and Ming in the West, they might have learned or copied that from the Kushan now. Oh. The, the, oh, well, that's very. Uh, right, that's possible. Well, the Mongols were obviously in touch with many more, with many uh, different peoples across the whole, that whole Asian continent, so possible. Joseph. Yeah, okay, thank you. That, that's very provocative. And I see that you are opening many questions. But one question I wonder if you are pursuing this line. So I know that you're trying to be very careful to find potency in terms of the sexuality, right? Mm -hmm. But then would you venture out to talk about potency in terms of Pleasure, or in mm. terms of power. Oh, am I? Um, because I'm trying to see how you compare what you've been talking to the institution of marriage and concubine. So we know those institutions involve way more than just sexuality. They involve wealth and mm -hmm. power. So I'm just seeing how you connect those. Things. Oh, I, I think that you know when I'm the title potent eunuch is is. Uh, Partly taking from the, the sensational stories which, which invent a sexual, a literal sexual potency in eunuchs, but I'm taking that as sort of the core, uh, you know, the, the 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 core of the the whole story about the eunuch uh, becoming powerful. So potent is both sexual potency and then political power. Yeah. But I'm I think I'm mostly interested in I'm what I'm interested in is the uh, 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 the the fantasies. The fantasy that's created about the eunuch. So when I say the word, when I say composite fantasy, it's coming from both historical sources and fictional and sensational rumor sources. Right. 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 Right, right. Well, there's also the, uh, a, a, you know, a disgust with them and a hatred of them, and so that that feeds into the these these vilifying stories that uh, um, that, that that invent these outlandish um, details. Um, one. Yeah. one Yeah, I would, I would, I would. I mean, I could reconsider that and, and, and uh, uh, you know, bring that in because that, that's a that's a good point. But I, I'm, um, I'm, I, you know, it's, it's from a slightly longer paper, but I still haven't gotten there yet. I, it, to have a complete image, you know, you really want to. Uh, there had to be ones who were truly remarkable. Uh, still very, very well. There were there were bodyguards in the Qing who were eunuchs. Okay, so the, the thought that the eunuch is automatically a weak man is, is wrong, okay? But then we, it's, it's completely, it's, it's certain that there were ones like Wei Zhongxian who were very talented and very, uh, 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 you know, their voices were, were, were stentorian and, uh, you know, so yeah, that should be included. Yes? Enjoy your talk. Thank you. Mm. Right. Uh, are the people who perform the procedures qualified? They have certain training. Or mm. Well, I think one basic thing is that people in pre-anesthesia times uh, just put up with pain much more than we would 
just die. We would faint away. Uh, no, but as far as I know from only the, the, the British, the article by G. Carter Stent, which incurs in the Journal of the North China Branch of the Royal Asiatic Society uh, in 1877, and it's one that, it's, it's one of the only sources that talks about it. And I don't remember all the details right now, but there are, there was a, a, a there were people who were licensed by the palace <clears throat> to carry out the operation. And um, you paid them a fee, you also, also had to sign a contract saying that you were doing this voluntarily, and then, then you underwent the operation, and uh, uh, they, as far as I recall, they, uh, after they, they completed the procedure, <clears throat> you were uh, plugged up so that you could not urinate for 24 hours, and if you made it through that phase, then you were supposedly going to be okay, but recovery would still take a month or so. And, and some men died. Um, many men, I think, suffered from incontinence. Some would get infected? Yes, people could get infected and die. Now, you have to think that when, if they did it on, without specialists, then, then they're just really taking their chances. But then again, if it's a little boy, uh, there's, there's less to lose. So, you know, who knows? I, we don't have reports. <laughs> We don't have reports. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. <laughs>